Let's talk about books. I'm pondering you are, but I will always try to bring you three books across multiple genres, including fiction and nonfiction, unless I have a special reason to do so otherwise. I'm obsessed with fantasy, especially epic fantasy and sword and sorcery, but I love reading in general. It's a way of living that offers infinite rewards. So the first book I'm going to read from today is my own. This is Thief of Destiny from Falstaff Books, released in 2017. I'm only going to read a few pages because I need to practice reading in front of others, so pardon me if there's any slip-ups. Manwe came about from watching many freedom movements fall apart during my college years, but from them was born this thief. Manwe is drawn into a one-man revolution after his lover and fence, Toba, is murdered by the Gaipians enslaving Manwe's people on the savannas of Jute where these stories take place. Please check out the book below in the description, and if you dig through these links, you might be able to get it for free. So let's begin. But beforehand, some context. Manwe has been kidnapped by a sorcerer named Cleon the Yellow, who is taking him deep into the glass jungles to steal this item called the Centaurian Torch. We join them in the midst of the quest. The center tunnel from the rotunda descended into a great stair. The dim light of another set of ancient torches flickered in the deep allowing Manwe to make out the stone steps. He took each one with care, using rocks he gathered again from the rotunda room to pressure the faces in search of traps. At the bottom of the channel stood a massive stone door, its face carved in an intricate lattice. Within the circle swirled jagged geometric patterns of a type Manwe had never seen before. He longed for his knife in that moment, a perfect tool for finding the seams and cracks in such doors. Instead, he used fingers, probing and gliding the runs of the stone until he came upon a space, a shallow but cleanly cut hole shaped in an eye. Manwe pawed the gold piece he had secured in the linen wraps around his wrists, much more curious about it now than he had been when he first filched it. Examining both the object and the hole, their matching size and shape, offered the solution. The gold piece slid perfectly in, and with a whirring sound preceding the grind of gears and squeaking pulleys from behind the door, the portal slowly rose up and past it lay a small antechamber. Manwe waited, frozen as he gazed into what he knew to be the final chamber of the temple. In the center rested another statue of a centaur, but unlike the first in the rotunda, this one did not stand proud on a raised platform. Instead, his hooves connected to the stone floor, more real and lifelike than any sculpture Manwe had ever seen. In the beast's hand was a sword as long as his arm. Sunshine from a skylight in the domed roof sparkled at the edge of an adamantine blade, cold and sharp. The sight of daylight itself invigorated Manwe, who strode to the room's center and looked up at the skylight. He could see the glaring skies behind them, the freedom of an escape far out of reach. His gaze back to the ground, he looked about for the item he had come for. Set on a stone table in a rear alcove, a foot-long tube glittered dully in its holder. Polished smooth with a silver sheen, the Centaurian torch went unadorned, a rod of nondescript presentation so simple, Manwe wondered if he had actually found the item of Cleon's desires. He came to it with care, blowing the dust off the table to better find any signs of traps. He gingerly lifted the rod from the holder, its weight light but sturdy. Never once did I think I'd see this. Manwe spun around, rod in hand and ready to fight. For a moment he wondered if Cleon secured himself in the few small shadows of the room. He tried to find the origin of the voice, its baritone strong but wizened. Who comes, Manwe called. How can one come when they're already here? He froze. No real shadow stained the walls or the floor, save one. He stared at the back of the centaur statue, to the delicate runs chiseled into its human back, the powerful curves of its haunches. Manwe forced himself not to blink, making sure he missed not one crucial detail. The dusty hide of the horse half, streaked in black and white, twitched its muscles, and when he looked long enough, the human shoulders of the centaur rose once and fell in a breath. And then the centaur turned his head. You can find this book below in the description. So this next book is something I'm leafing through one page at a time and using as the central text for my meditation practices. This is the Tao Te Ching as reinterpreted by Ursula K. Le Guin, one of my absolute favorite fantasy authors and the creator of the Earthsea Cycle. This was given to me by my wonderful wife, a goddess of baking brunettes and midnight dreams. This is Le Guin's take on a foundational text of Taoism by Lao Tzu, a legendary mystic who helped establish a set of philosophy, spiritual practices, and folk traditions native to a large eastern power monitoring this platform at all times. Here's the passage within the Tao I keep coming back to these days. I hope it will feed you as it has fed me.
Book 1, Chapter 9 Being Quiet Brim fill the bowl, it'll spill over. Keep sharpening the blade, you'll soon blunt it. Nobody can protect a house full of gold and jade. Wealth, status, pride are their own ruin. To do good, work well, and lie low is the way of the blessing. Please check out this book below in the description. Finally, and you can tell I love this book because my toddler spent plenty of time trying to take it away from me so I pay more attention to him, this is The Sword of Destiny by Andrew Sapowski, the famed Polish author of The Witcher series starring Geralt of Rivia, Unifer of Engenberg, Cyrilla of Sintra, and Dandelion, though they call him Yaskier, in the amazing Netflix series starring Henry Cavill and Company, which I cannot recommend enough. It's really great. These books have been around for a while, but I only recently got into them. I was given The Last Wish for Christmas a few years ago and loved its densely layered sword and sorcery trappings. Now, unlike The Last Wish, The Sword of Destiny is a bit slow in the middle and departs from the characterizations given to us in the first book, which is more in line with the show's presentation and kind of remains its thematic starting point for what Netflix is doing. One of the main characters I adore in the first book and in the Netflix series is basically unlikable here, but beyond that disappointment, it, this book really succeeds in its rich dialogue. You finish every conversation you read because the voices are natural, settled deeply with and their characters, and tell a story without having to tell it detail by gross detail. Though I have to say, Sapowski's descriptions are really something for any writer to look at. Short to the point, they build really solid images. Many compliments should be given to the translators who rendered these from the original Polish, as Sapowski took many short stories and kind of rendered them into a more novel-like structure. I also have to say that towards the end of this book, Sapowski does some very special things with writing out of sequence that they tried to do in the Netflix series but didn't really succeed at. He succeeds with them here. Though not better than The Last Wish, you should definitely check out this book. Let's read a bit. So I'm going to be reading from page 131, which is the beginning of a short story called The Internal Flame. Pardon me if I take liberties with some of the voices. You pig, you plague-stricken warbler, you trickster. Geralt, his interest piqued, led his mare around the corner of the alleyway. Before he located the source of the screams, a deep, stickily, glassy clink joined them. A large jar of cherry preserves, thought the witcher. A jar of cherry preserves makes that noise when you throw it at someone from a great height, or with great force. He remembered it well. When he lived with Yennefer, she would occasionally throw jars of preserve at him in anger, jars she had received from clients. Yennefer had no idea how to make preserve. Her magic was fallible in that respect. A large group of onlookers had formed around the corner, outside a narrow, pink-painted cottage. A young, fair-haired woman in a nightdress was standing on a tiny balcony decorated with flowers, just beneath the steep eaves of the roof. Bending a plump, fleshy arm, visible beneath the frills of her nightdress, the woman hurled down a chipped flower pot. A slim man in a plum bonnet with a white feather jumped aside like a scalded cat, and the flower pot crashed into the ground just in front of him, shattering into pieces. Please, Vespula, the man in the bonnet shouted, don't lend credence to this gossip. I was faithful to you. May I perish if it is not true. You bastard, you son of the devil, you wretch, the plump blonde yelled and went back into the house, no doubt in search of further missiles. Hey, Dandelion, called the Witcher, leading his resisting and snorting mare onto the battlefield. How are you? What's going on? I should try to do this like Henry Cavill. <clears throat> hey, Dandelion. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, hey Dandelion, called the Witcher, leading his resisting and snorting bear onto the battlefield. How are you? What's going on? How are you? What's going on? Hey man. <laughs> Nothing special, said the troubadour, grinning. The usual. Greetings, Geralt. What are you doing here? Bloody hell, look out! A tin cup whistled through the air and bounced off the cobbles with a clang. Dandelion picked it up, looked at it, and threw it in the gutter. Take those rags, the blonde woman screamed, the face, the frills on her plump breast swaying gracefully. You learn a lot when you read stuff out loud. And get out of my sight. Don't set foot again here, you bastard. Those aren't mine, Dandelion said in astonishment, taking a pair of men's trousers with odd colored legs from the ground. I've never had trousers like these in my life. Get out. I don't want you anymore. You, you... 
Do you know what you're like in bed? Pathetic. Pathetic, do you hear? Do you hear, everybody? Another flower pot whistled down, a dried stalk that had grown out of its flapping. Dandelion barely managed to dodge. Following the flower pot, a copper cauldron of at least two and a half gallons came spinning down. The crowd of onlookers standing a safe distance away from the canode reeled in laughter. The more active and unprincipled jokers among them applauded and incited the blonde to further action. She doesn't have a crossbow in the house, does she? The witcher asked anxiously. Can't be ruled out, said the poet, lifting his head upwards to the balcony. She has a load of junk in there. Did you see those trousers? <laughs> okay. And with that, you can check out the book below in the description. I'm blessed to say that on Pondering the Orb, I'm able to highlight and feature artists that I love and adore. I have a special passion for melodic death metal and synthwave, and on this first episode, I'm thrilled to feature inspirations in both fields. Countless Skies is a melodic death metal band from Hertfordshire in the UK. This track, Wonder, is taken from their debut album in 2016, called New Dawn. Art for this wonderful album was created by Carl Ellis. Enjoy, and we'll be right back.
We're now going to slow things down and ease into a calm. The next track is by a synthwave composer who made me fall in love with the genre in the first place. Croji is an independent music composer from France who caught me with a Better Hours EP released in 2021. The art for this album is done by Andrew Walker, who is not only a serious horse in electronic music, but also is a fantastic bottle artist in the craft beer world. This track is called The Heights, which Croji created in collaboration with another great act, Alpha Room. I'm dedicating this track to the neighborhood I live in, nestled in one of the greatest cities upon this pale blue dot. Before we play this track, let's change the ambiance a little bit. Oh, wow. Okay, see why you Zoomers do that. That's fucking fantastic. This segment will usually be taken up by an interview in a podcast format, but on Pondering the Orb, I never want you to leave with less than what you came with. If I can offer something worthwhile that you can take with you after our time together is over, then I've done my duty as a human being. Today, for our more segment, we're going to meditate together. There is a link below to my blog where I discuss this technique, which is quite basic, but if you want something a little bit more in-depth, I hope you consider taking the time to read it. Meditation is a process. The best way to learn is by committed, mindful action. So let's act. First, let's get some easy things out of the way. This isn't easy. 
no matter what people tell you, you shouldn't expect to just pick this up out of nowhere. I don't expect you to last the full five minutes that you're going to watch me attempt here. In fact, I think that, that would be kind of crazy. However, what we're trying to do is we're trying to train ourselves to focus on our breath with a mental count and find a steadiness in the myriad of noises, smells, and everything else our senses throw at us at all times. By practicing the mindful silencing of ourselves, we are able to learn how to take a step back from our sadness, worries, and fixations and exist as ourselves and our, ourselves alone. Second thing you need to remember is that it's okay if you get distracted. Meditation is learning how to put aside those distractions, but that takes practice. Finally, you set your practice. Want to learn to meditate standing up? There's a method for that, just as there are entire disciplines on how to do this, and finding the right way for you is important. Take your time, do yourself a favor, and listen to more than just me. Meditation is about listening to all the things you can't hear. I can't say everything that needs to be said, and neither can someone else. You have to go out and find it on your own. Again, this is about committed, mindful practice. Now. If you want to watch me show you how to meditate for the next few minutes and then skip to the part where we actually do it together, I've tried to break this down into sections where you can go back and listen to the instructions without having to sit through me with my eyes closed. You can do that on your own time. If you just want to listen and watch, then of course, be welcomed. We're going to start by placing ourselves in a traditional position with our legs crossed or tucked underneath us. I always try to keep it loose so the blood keeps flowing to my feet and they don't fall asleep, which really sucks. As you can see, ah, I have a meditation pillow, which is great because it positions me above my feet and allows me to keep my legs folded without them falling asleep. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our hands and we're going to rest them in our lap or in our knees in a neutral position. I usually choose my knees, you can do your lap, but just put them in a comfortable place. We're going to begin. Let's close our eyes and take a few deep breaths. No need to worry about imagery or centering yourself. We're just going to focus on our breath. Now, there is a count to the meditative breath that is helpful for beginners. One breath in through the nose. One breath out through the mouth for a count of one. Two. Three. Four. Now we're going to close our eyes and we're going to start again. We're going to count our breaths for five whole minutes. Remember, you don't have to stick with me through this the entire time. Let's close our eyes and let's get started. A few deep breaths. In through the nose, out through the mouth for one. One, two, three, four, five,
when you are ready, open your eyes. Take a few more deep breaths. And we're finished. Thank you for taking this time to meditate with me. So that's the first episode of Pondering the Orb, and soon we will go back to pondering this orb on our own. I'm here because I want to fill in some gaps. A lot of people are lonely, and I hope this place becomes somewhere they feel they can go to be somewhere else with someone else. I want to be that place, or at least add another choice to the many options you have in solving this dilemma. There's been some really great music played and highlighted, and I want to keep introducing you to art you haven't seen or enjoyed yet. Yes, I obviously want you to pick up my books. Hopefully enjoy them enough to leave a review on Amazon where that really, really matters. But I don't want this show to be a place where I only hawk shit at you. I think with Patreons and links and everything content creators have to fight with to get noticed, the best I can do is ask for your attention, hope you follow through, but otherwise there's no real subscription model besides hitting that subscribe button below and signing up for the newsletter below in the links. The important thing about this show, and I think literature, music, arts, crafts, and other things presented here, is that they're expressions of the human condition and experience, going back to our ancestors 300,000 years ago. I think human beings are worthwhile investments simply because we have the potential to actually do better. I want this to be a place where people can come and put down their nihilism, or their misanthropy, or their political flag, or their sorrows, and be humans together enjoying the things we create. I'm not planning to sit here and browbeat you with my books when my books can do that for me. There will be politics, culture, and questions in this content, of course, but when you're here, I just want you to relax, be entertained, and hopefully be at ease with what you have to deal with after this show's over. Maybe we go deeper into that too in the future. Maybe we try listening for all the things we can't hear. One of the things I want to end on is a theme I hope to revisit. Grace. As you've probably noticed, I've read a lot of this content to you because writing and reading is the way I find comfort and can express myself the most clearly. I'm going to read this part too, and end today talking about grace because the goddess back in the book section put me on a mission not long ago, install more grace in the world. I find she has a sense of things that are missing. Knowing how much she feels the missing parts in me, I listen. Grace is both a pair of nouns and a verb, yet if you take all three of them together, you will see an arising challenge. Let's look at them. The first is a noun. Simple elegance and refined movement. Perhaps how we pass through the world and the impacts we make upon it. Courteous goodwill. Perhaps this is what we want to express to others through those impacts. And then finally, there's a verb. But strangely, grace is also to do honor and credit by one's presence or lack thereof. This is a strange notion, but in the strange things we often find the most beautiful. Perhaps the reason I'm drawn to this isn't simply because I wake up with grace every day beside me, but we live upon the crack of an age where the lack of it is taking its toll on the world. We can keep playing into the damage. We can keep moving to attack each other and defend our selfish wants, which are reactions to things I don't think we're having real conversations about. Or we can learn to start again. We can find good in each other and face the terrifying notion that most of our enemies are not actually enemies at all, just scared people. We can do the work of exercising our millennium's ancient fears that causes us to react in such terrible ways in the first place. We can plumb the darkness for a spark we keep being told is not there, even if it means relighting it ourselves and holding it up for a torch that it is. Perhaps we'll figure out how to act and how to recede, allowing space for the good while we try to mediate the bad. And perhaps we'll start to see that it isn't so simple to qualify what's good or bad either. There's a benefit in this, in a way. When you eliminate the shadows, you usually find the object. It's stunning how much a slant of light can trick us. I hope we all learn to walk out of our caves. We might rediscover an inheritance we lost and get to keep it this time. But only if we make the march to find it. Thank you for joining me. I hope you will check out the books in the links below in the description. Follow the musicians on their channels, enjoy the work, but more than anything, stay well and know that you are worthy. Safe journey.